Within Night City itself and throughout a lot of other cities of the new United States of America, different gangs run their respective regions, setting up their own culture, ways of life, and rules for those who live below them. For many citizens, they have accepted these gangs, turned a blind eye to their business decisions, and avoided them at all times, because quite frankly, they terrify them. However, for those who do not wish to come face to face with these gangs, venturing out into the countryside, desert, and wilderness is not much better for them either, because during and after the collapse happened, many individuals would seek to create a new life for themselves away from corporate control, and thus roam the outside of cities looking for resources to help their own. These groups would be known as the Nomads, large packs of loyal families who seek to just live their own way, free from corporate control and constantly on the move. If anyone were to harm a member of their Nomad clan, they would hit them back hard and fast, as no one will harm their family. Family. But amongst all of these nomads, many different clans and even nations litter their land, having their own dramatically different ideologies, and more often than not, fight amongst themselves to claim land and resources. So who are these nomad clans and nations? What makes them so different from one another? Where are they primarily located? And where are they now? Well, in today's video, we will be exploring all of the nomad clans and nations from the cyberpunk universe to see who the true dominant family is out in the new United States. This is the story of all of the nomad clans and nations from Cyberpunk. The overall history of the nomads really dates back to when the corporations were taking over the world. Back in the day, most nomadic families came from simple agricultural backgrounds, simple folk with simple lives. However, one day the corporations would move in and steal all of their land from them and force them out of their homes, leaving them completely homeless. This move by the corporations caused lots of pain and made it so these people had to just travel around the country in cars and portable homes to try and find a new place to settle. Because of the harsh nature of the world on these long walks, survival was extremely difficult, especially when it came to the years of the collapse, which would only go on to make these traveling packs form close bonds and grow in size, as they would stick out for each other and essentially see one another as family. They would defend each other, share resources, and make it so their survival was a priority. As the years progressed on, these small packs that could be anything from two people to 200 people, they would go on to set up trade links, set up roles in their groups, such as doctors, leaders, mechanics, and so on, and would even go on to hire themselves out to people in need, which would include small cities that needed defending during the corporate wars. This helped them on their survival goal. However, it would leave them prime targets for the police who disliked these groups not doing things officially, and disliked how they saw themselves as truly free individuals away from the law and order of the cities and towns. But moving into the 2020s, these groups would continue to roam the lands, widely recognizable by their convoy of customizable vehicles and RVs, going from location to location making trade links and taking resources for themselves. For a good while, these nomads were all isolated tribes who had their own unique identities depending on where they were from or what worldviews they held. However, after the bombings of the Arasaka Tower in 2023 in Night City, the nomad clans would all come together to unite and move into the city to essentially try and take over all of the transportation links in and out of Night City to get to any other part of the US. Not only that, but the nomads would then become the biggest investors and builders of infrastructure within Night City, majorly responsible for repairing services and then controlling those services. As the rebuilding process underwent within the 2040s, the government of Night City turned to these nomad clans once again, as well as a variety of edge runners, to help make this city better once again. But life wasn't as simple as it seemed for the nomads, with many things happening within the families themselves during these times, allowing for many groups to form and also split during this. Which brings us to our first of the nomad factions, the largest known nomad group in all of America, the Snake Nation.
The Snake Nation was an unofficial nation which aimed at bringing the voice for the nomad people to the larger nomad political sphere. As many of the other big nomad clans started creating the Six Nations, the Snake Nation jumped onto this and made it clear that they were not to be ignored and thus began to form. The main thinking was that smaller nomad groups were worried their voices would not be heard compared to the other big groups who were controlling both nomad and static communities. And so to get their voices heard, they had to solidify together and form their own nation. Thus, creating the Snake Nation. The only problem with the Snake Nation really is that because they are a formed together group of smaller nomad clans into one, making up one million members, they have a lot of different views compared to other more structured nomad nations, making them arguably the most loosely organized one within the seven nomad nations. Their flag ultimately summarizes what they are like as a nation. Most of it is just plain emptiness with not much forming together, which is represented with the block of red. However, when they do form together, Together as one to hit their enemies, they are extremely deadly, which is represented by the white snake. Their motto also clearly states their intent to anyone who wants to disrupt this large unorganized nation or wants to silence them, with it being simply, don't tread on me. To many, the snake nation is seen more as a revolutionary nomad tribe that brings together many from different backgrounds and ideologies and forms them into one large group willing to do anything to protect their nation. Because of this, it is easily the most diverse of all of of the nomad clans and as mentioned previously easily the largest with 1 million nomads within it. With such a diverse group it enables them to enrich their economy as they compile a lot of individuals with many different skill sets. For the snake nation in recent years however they have put their focus more into the construction industry as well as many salvage jobs. With this goal they would go on to be involved in a series of projects within Kansas that would only help develop their skills but also help gain them a reputation amongst different parties parts of the country. However, for the Snake Nation, many members despise how much competition there is between them and the other nomad clans, as well as the more structured factions. For their leader, a once Mormon from the Utah desert, Freddie Douglas, he especially does not like the power games that people play and ultimately just wants to go back to a time where nomads were independent and not a part of all of these different nations. Douglas is, however, extremely inexperienced as a leader as he has only been a nomad himself for just over a decade. But because he was extremely stable and willing to work with people outside of the Snake Nation, he was chosen to be their representative and help this nomad clan develop themselves in this ever-changing world. The Snake Nation continues on to this day in 2077 and is still the largest of the nomad nations, with many other nomad factions even considering joining it and making it even stronger. To many, this Snake Nation is a way of going back to a form of normality, but at the same time staying somewhat in independent from the Corpo's rule. It is essentially the best of both worlds, and with a family as big as one million, you know that if you are part of the Snake Nation, you will be massively protected from anyone seeking harm. And that is certainly appealing to one of the next Nomad clans who are on the opposite side of the spectrum as one of the smallest clans, that being the Bakers. The Bakers are an extremely small clan of nomads with not much information around about how they formed or what their ultimate goal was. However, their downfall is recorded pretty well and their numbers are recorded as just being around 10. For years, the Bakers only had just one leader, that being Salita Baker, who was extremely charismatic. Salita lasted as their leader for many, many years, which ultimately became the problem for the clan as no one challenged her, meaning she could ultimately do what she wanted and the others would all always take what she said as fact, never really forming their own opinions. Because of this lack of challenge, Salita ruled with an iron fist, with some behind closed doors claiming that she was essentially a tyrant. But despite this fear of her leadership, she was actually well respected and well loved. Maybe without this strict rule the clan would have fallen years ago, but who knows. She was their leader and the clan loved and respected her. Near the end of her life when she was clearly getting sick, still no one challenged her leadership, which she came to regret and wish for in her final words. But as she passed away, the clan had no other options. A new leader had to be chosen. With her death came a transition period for the clan, with Delo Baker taking it up first. But this was not to last long, as after two years, Delo was replaced by Lorna Ruiz, and then after another one to two years, was again replaced by Shari Dalin. Delo was tragically killed in a skirmish with Raffin Shiv, also known as Rogue Nomads. Lorna resigned on her own accord, and Shari just did 
disappeared for good from the camp, never to be seen again. The Baker's clan was in utter shambles as no one was strong enough to lead them forward, with every member stating they needed Salita. They could not do it without her, and now that she was gone, no one was strong enough to make any decisive decisions that would progress them forward. Eventually, many of the Baker clan left to seek out other opportunities within the world, with the clan essentially merging with the Snake Nation. In the end, Salita and Delo Baker had died. Shari had completely disappeared. Their other family member V also left to seek out other opportunities in Night City, and the others joined the numbers of the Snake Nation. The moral of the story of the Baker clan was that the life of a nomad is not a simple one. Survival is about sticking together as a clan, and unfortunately, without a strong leader to put rules and decision in place, the clan was just doomed to fail, which is evident with what had happened with this small clan of around 10. Another nomad nation that was part of the Seven Nations was known as the Thelas Nation, who were essentially regarded as pirates to governments, as they were lawless individuals who lived out within the waters. To these individuals, they love the idea that they are seen as pirates and wear it like a badge of honor. Formed through fishermen villages, marine camps, and coastal inhabitants of the Caribbean, these nomads found themselves under attack by government forces as well as waterborne gangs, and with no way of defending themselves, took their families, grabbed their boats, and set sail away from their once homes. When on the sea, however, they would also go on to meet up with others who were labelled as simply boat people, believed to be migrants who were refused immigration and were stuck out on the ocean, as well as others such as former drug smugglers who had taken the luxury boats and distanced themselves from those dangerous individuals. For a time, this new group of pirates found themselves in heated debates with the Navy as they had refused to identify their ships and register them to authorities, hence why they were labelled as pirates. For a while, America could use their navy and coast guard to secure the waters, but after a while the government realized they did not have the resources or coast guard anymore to scan all of the waterways in North America, and because of that, these nomad pirates were able to be safe from navy scans. With this news spreading, this allowed other coastal villages and areas to want to join this new faction, and many did grab their boats and join their society. This allowed their numbers to grow into the thousands as they started to take over the whole of Mississippi. Missouri, St. Lawrence, and Columbia Rivers, as well as the Great Lakes all over the coastal areas of the North American continent. Soon after the collapse, many of these nomads started taking over drilling platforms and formed mobile marine cities constantly building up their coastal projects, with some being New Galveston and Tampa on the Gulf of Mexico. Their numbers just kept growing and growing as they spread out all over the continent, and even to this date, it is unknown how many members of the Thelus Nation there actually are, but they are easily the most mobile nomad nation out there. Every boat works as a close-knit group, with all of them having specific roles such as captain, quartermaster, navigator, medtech, and engineering techies. And even if they do not have a set role, they will be seen as in reserve, just in case another member they are learning from dies or suddenly decides to leave the ship. But ultimately, they are a family and will all work together as one unit on their specific ship. As for the economy, the nomad pirates do a variety of tasks to help them survive such as hiring jobs for anyone who needs their assistance, marine farming and other aquaculture, smuggling, cargo hauling, refugee transportation, and even, surprisingly even to the nomads, media broadcasting. Broadcasting is one of their greatest features for the Thelas, as it is not only massively appealing for some studios within cities to get their messages out within governmental or broadcasting control, but it also provides the clan with a large income from providing an extremely stable pirate broadcast to many. It is also a big statement to the government, again, as they could never really track the broadcasts, meaning it showed they could mess with those at the top of the government and could not be punished for it. Smuggling and attacking other ships is also a big source of income, with many of the pirates being able to track down important vessels and looting them with their impressive arsenal at their disposal. The crews will not kill any of the other crew unless they become extremely aggressive, so most
most of the time cargo will be taken without any bloodshed, but they can overwhelm heavily militarized vessels if they so wished. But for many of them they are just simple fishermen and women who have to just resort to their skills as well as steering just so they can survive out in the harsh world. The only thing the pirates do not partake in is slave trading and kidnapping, which the governments try and spin stating that is all they do and is the only reason their society grows in size, trying to make the public side with the government over these nomads. To this day the nomad nation continues to live within the waters of North America as well as the great rivers being led by John Silver Wilson. Essentially they are just regular nomads doing everything they can to survive whilst hitting back at the government who put them in that position in the first place. The only difference being they are much harder to locate as they are out within the large ocean and are constantly on the move. Maybe one day the American Navy will be able to grow in size again and finally wipe this nation out. But even then, the Thelus have grown so large over the years, they would be hard to wipe out as they know the ocean better than anyone. One of the independent Noman clans that don't really have any affiliation with the Seven Nations are the Technomancers, who, like their name suggests, are pretty smart when it comes to technology. Originating as just a group of mercenary scientists, these nomads would go around North America actively seeking out complex problems to solve. Because of this goal they keep in mind, they have become vital assets for corporations who are willing to pay them for their skills and services, as well as other nomad clans who need their assistance. But their most stable way of making an income is through the creation of their own patent-able technology. With these creations, they would go on to license them out to manufacturers to create into things like the optical assault rifle unique battery system, or would just go on to sell it to a corp they couldn't completely trust in the long run. But on top of that, they are also able to repair and create almost any machine imaginable. As the years progressed, the ambition of finding the world's answers to problems escalated as they would go on to find and work with digital librarians to to reclaim knowledge that was thought lost in some of the areas of the world. This has led them to be mainly set up within the city of Chicago near the university there in an attempt to help the people living there decontaminate the city from the bioplague that was set off there in 2012. Their other goal within this city is to try and make it so the Sears Tower can be salvaged instead of outright destroyed, leading to many of the clan assisting in materials research to try and save this dark specter of a tower that just lingers over the skyline. This was even more crucial as previously a scout team sent by Stormtech was sent into the structure, but for some reason they never returned. And since then, the corporation has been mysterious in their antics. Although the clan seems content with Chicago, they do still journey the roads with their heavily advanced vehicles that are able to benefit from the CH-00H2 oil by over 300% compared to regular engines using that same fuel. Not only that, but within these vehicles are so many advanced bits of machinery enabling them to set up shops, biotech research labs, state-of-the-art hospitals, an AI known as the Elders, and living quarters for all of the 30 members of the clan. But although this technology is far more advanced than the regular nomads and citizens of the government-owned cities, it is all salvaged things that they have heavily modified by these extremely skillful individuals. And saying that, although they are impressive pieces of machinery, they are not the nicest to look at, as they are just a collection of wires, tubes and electronics, making them pretty unappealing for most outsiders. Because of how small this clan is, they do not really go for scout roles or anything like that. Instead, if they need a job doing they will usually seek out other nomad clans to do that work for them, as they only focus on the technology side of things, as well as seeking out knowledge. To this day, there are around 60 to 90 members of the Technomancers, and whilst they might seem like a corpo nomad hybrid, it is safe to say that these nomads are some of the most intelligent people within North America, and with how much information they have about technology, they are really not a threat to either the corporations or the other nomad clans of the Seven Nations. With their skills and knowledge, they are some of the most vital individuals you could ask for that could supply you with some of the most advanced technology that you have ever seen. Moving on to another member of the Seven Nations is the weirdest No Man Clan out there still to this day, and it's confusing why it's still called a Nomad Clan, and that is the group known as Metacorp, 
or simply Meta. Not to be confused with the lizard android and leg enthusiast Mark Zuckerberg, Metacorp is the youngest of the nomad clans to be set up, fully founded in 2012. So what makes Metacorp so weird? Well, it's the fact that they are actually a corporation who was set up by the Meta family, a proud group who were ex-military and support service backgrounds within South America. Their founder being Jonathan Meta, who was an army officer with years of service and an absolute ton of decorations. But the reason for his service was a pretty tragic one and dated back to the 1970s. Back then, America was at war with Vietnam and during that horrifying war, Jonathan's uncle had been killed in battle. When the body was returned home, a funeral was held, but just outside the area, protests were taking place with many claiming his uncle as being a baby killer and other horrific things. Jonathan was stunned and saddened by this, but also confused. How could they hate this man they did not know? And why, after he'd been given a Medal of Honor, was he a bad person. In Jonathan's eyes, he was a loyal citizen who had saved dozens of people, but that did not matter to the protesters who started to throw tomatoes and rocks at the casket. After that event, Jonathan vowed that he too would sign up to become a soldier, aspiring to be like his uncle. And because of his name and what his uncle had done for his country, this opened many doors for Jonathan. But sadly, due to the collapse, not much is known about what happened to Jonathan's career within the army, as those documents had been destroyed. Most of Jonathan's story during during this time actually became lost as he kept disappearing off the radar, with only some moments being recorded such as him carrying a football for the president and traveling to the jungles of South America with the newly formed 11th Special Forces, with some rumors stating he was a member of the Rangers, Delta Force, the Pittman Project, the Madeline Drug Cartel, Disney Corporation, and the Dallas Cowboys, which many people say was just completely untrue. The year was now 2008 and a big change was happening as the civilians had redesigned the federal government. But as a consequence to this action, all records of Jonathan Meta disappeared, which did not become evident to him until 2011, after the end of the Second South Am War. According to the records, when people were wanting to come home with all of the troops and equipment, Jonathan Meta had been recorded as having died in Vietnam, and because of it, he and two million other individuals were simply denied transportation to the US. In any other circumstance, he could have gotten out of it. The problem was he was a commander commanding officer of a unit that did not officially exist, in a special forces group that did not officially exist, in a war that again did not officially exist. With nothing else to do and angry at the situation, Meta left the American command post at San Jose, Costa Rica, and with the aid of several hundred men were going to hijack three C-5B Galaxy aircrafts to the port of Panama. Arriving here, he would also join up with another thousand more abandoned Americans, and with them grabbed more ships floating within the Panama coast. With this large force and equipment, Meta and his crew declared their independence as a sovereign nation, and even were going to threaten nuclear destruction if they were not recognized as such. But why were they so aggressive so suddenly? Well, it's because after serving their country in a barbaric war, these servicemen who had joined Meta had been shunned by not only their government, but also the citizens who they saw every day of their lives. To them, they were monsters and not welcome anymore, causing the service meant to be furious at the treatment they had been given after putting their life on the line to protect them. Because of this, they wanted no part in their society anymore, and with the military wanting them dead if they returned, they claimed that independence to be safe from the government's wrath. And with the billions of dollars they had stolen in hardware, they could easily secure that, and with it officially formed Metacorp to be, at first, a security and maritime construction firm. By 2013, Meta was thriving as it would go on to construct the Atlantis Phase 2, as well as New Gavaston, alongside the other nomads of the Thelus Nation, and with the profits gained from this, would use the funds to construct a mobile island city named Metakey. By 2020, the island was finally finally constructed and was open to the public with great response as it ultimately had no national laws to deal with. The only things banned were murder and slavery, which was strictly illegal. This island would be seen as their home, being labeled as Hong Kong, Rio de Janeiro and Zurich all in one, sitting in the Gulf of Mexico. This island's construction was also helped by Metacorp's creation of the first ever ACPA or Assisted Combat Personnel Army.
armor, essentially a form of power armor. This armor was finally created in 2017 and was immediately sold to Militech, which as mentioned helped them with their funding of Metaki Island. To this day, the group known as Metacorp are still not regarded as an official nation, but only as a nomad community. Realistically, this is true, as they do not obey anything the governments want them to do and have their own laws in play. They will do what other nomad clans do, renting out their services as well as hiring other nomads to help them with their work. And with all the things Metacorp have done, they have generated $3 billion, which has gone straight into the nomad economy. And because of their major involvement, in this, they have finally been seen and accepted as a true nomad nation, and with it, became part of the Nomad Seven Nations. It's pretty safe to say that Metacorp are no joke. They are one of the most trained group of individuals who were just abandoned by their government and people, and because of that have used it to create their own incredible city that is massively popular and enables them to create a fantastic economy as well as fun technology projects to defend them from any government trying to shut them down once and for all. Like the Metacorp, the Folk Nation is also a late entry into the Nomad society. The Folk Nation gang actually started in the mid-90s and was seen as one of the most powerful gangs within Chicago and actually the world. The reason they were so dangerous was said to be because they had to form a close society due to how dangerous all the other groups were within this area. And with this solidarity amongst their members, it helped them to overcome and get stronger over time. Within these years, the Folk Nation became known for their very strong sense of family and unity, and that was what made them so strong. The main way people joined the Folk Nation was by being cast out from their more traditional family structures and being almost adopted by this group as their new family. This crew would idolize a new urban lifestyle, or as some labeled it, nascent black culture, changing up their music, fashion, views on drug use and habits, child rearing and sense of community. But for many outsiders, this rise in the new way of life was concerning to them as they they couldn't understand how they could put aside their native and ethnic cultures to form a new one. But to the members, they stated it was what they wanted and it was just a good way to be. At some point in their lives, they actively decided that they wanted to leave their past lives and traditions behind and wanted a fresh start to life. During the start of the collapse, this Folk Nation gang reached up to 50,000 members and when the collapse got worse, this gang kept to themselves and only battled others if it were necessary for their survival. But that was all they were trying to do during this period, survive. This was so important that during this time they even made it their sole life goal to survive martial law as well as helping others survive it as well. With this, they would go on to set up a black market distribution network from their HQ in Chicago and eventually would go on to start using transportation to help people escape areas like Oklahoma City. In return for helping people, the Folk Nation asked not for money, but just their own help in return as they understood people did not have any to offer them as they had lost everything in the process. Because of their travels helping people through their tough times, this allowed the Folk Nation to survive the bio plague of 2012, but at the same time paid a big cost for it, losing their upper leadership who were based within Chicago during it. With no leadership, the Folk Nation needed a new leader and almost immediately one man rose to the occasion, that being Mr. Cool, who took over the leadership role and started to rebirth the Folk Nation as a nomad group. Cool was a recognizable name who had been known for doing large-scale transportation and smuggling operations in the past and realized that through transportation came survival. According to Cool, staying in one place for a long while was just tempting fate and would no doubt cause another cataclysm to hit their community. With this, he would also go on to send messages to other nomad clans to look for work in places like Balsam, Night City, and Stateline California, trying to help rebuild the country. Cool ultimately was moved by the events of Chicago and really wanted to make it so that the nomads came together with him, accepting many of the long walk refugees making him an iconic name within the nomad community, as someone who could help them out and as a sign of thanks would send work his way. To this date, the Folk Nation are still massive on their transportation business and are desperate to get Chicago back up and running as it will massively benefit them and their transportation network. The other reason for setting up Chicago again is because quite 
quite a few of the Folk Nation are tired of constantly traveling and just want to settle down somewhere as their main base. Their black market business is closed now, however that does not stop the government forces from trying to shut down business the Folk Nation do get involved with. But at the end of the day, the Folk Nation have done more for the country than the government ever had. And without their help, many more lives could have been lost within the collapse. And their overall survival has been thanks to their great leader and proud nomad, Mr. Cool. Closely to the Folk Nation is the small subgroup known as the Force of Nature. This group completely prides itself on the fact that it is fiercely independent and strives as far away from the societal norms as possible. Any similarities to normal society would be seen as almost heresy to the Force of Nature, so everything they do and every action they take is to make themselves vastly unique. With that said, however, the Force of Nature works as the Folk Nation's special forces. They are a group of fierce warriors who have many different skills for featuring a few techs, med techs, as well as a shaman and a fixer. Each member of the Force of Nature believes they have a totem spirit which gives them their strength and watches over them as well as being attached to it. These can be in the form of a dog, wolf, coyote, bear, raccoon, and many other animals out there. With this in mind, each totem is then worshipped in whatever way the individual chooses, and on top of the spirit animals, the members also share spirituality in the spirits of earth, wind, and fire. Uh, I mean earth, wind, sun, and moon. Their leader is the shaman known as Ramus, who takes the form of a wolf. But Ramus does not communicate with anyone outside of the clan. Instead, that is down to the family's fixer known as Fred, who takes the form of a cat, both being the oldest members of the clan. Although there are just 30 members of the Force of Nature, they are the most expensive to hire due to how skilled they are as warriors. However, they do work hand in hand with the Folk Nation, giving them what they want, and also having the Folk Nation giving them what they want in return, which isn't always money. They also don't limit themselves there, taking on roles from corporations, rock bands, and the US Marshals Service to help them have the right amount of resources to continue to survive the way they want. Motorcycles are the preferred mode of transportation for this small clan of nomads, as it allows them to travel fast and over different terrains, as well as being the perfect vehicle for scatter and swarm tactics when fighting their foes. That's not to say they only use that, as they also have utility vehicles and support vehicles that carry their supplies and anything they need for their next job. But if they were to venture out without the support vehicle, all of these warriors would equip supply packs that would help them for up to seven days. But in the end, the Force of Nature crew are some of the deadliest nomads out within North America. Without them, some of the other nomad crews and even corporations might struggle to survive and take out things that threaten them. Although to outsiders they are a scary bunch to come into contact with, they are willing to negotiate and work with them if the price is right, but you would not want to be on the bad end of this group of nomads, or you will never see the light of day ever again. The next nomad nation on this list is the clan known as the Jodes, originally just a group of individuals that came from Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas. Unlike many other clans within this list, the Jodes were not driven away by the collapse or corpos taking their home. Instead, they were driven out of their home by an ecological crisis in which their land became uninhabitable, meaning all of their food reserves died. This was all thanks to the great sandstorms of 1998, which devastated all of the countryside, forcing people to start heading west towards California. This journey was long and brutal for the people who would become the Jodes, as all they wanted was to find a place to rest their head. For a while there was a set plan to prepare for the coming autumn so they could cross the Rocky Mountains, but as people tried gathering resources many people got angry with the fact that more and more hungry individuals started to join them in their travels, making it harder for them to survive the journey and share resources. But that wasn't the worst of it, as they were suddenly under attack from another group of of townies and farmers who were also desperate for food and were definitely going to kill them if they could. As the attack happened at night they were able to eventually fend off the attackers but it was not an easy victory despite all their preparations. Firefights happened all over the Colorado countryside but the raiders could not fight through and withdrew from the battle without many casualties. For the travelers though they were extremely angry and had lost over 400 people in the attack. But that next day a supposed man of God named Malachi came up 
up with a new idea that each family in the group of travelers should send one member to represent them in a council. With Malachi suggesting this idea, he would then become the chairman of the meeting. Here in their troubles, it became clear that these people needed a solution because currently they were tired and had no plans for what they were going to do when they actually got to California. But eventually after hearing from all of the representative members of each family, Malachi revealed they all had the same thing in mind. They all wanted protection. They all wanted revenge on their attackers and they all wanted the freedom of being able to leave this coalition when the time was right for them. With this, Malachi suggested a partnership and that they should all sign an agreement. Similar to the other great pieces of history like the Mayflower Compact, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which were available for all to see. With this, they forged the compact, which would in later years become referred to as folklore and legend. The compact had three crucial points that were rumored to be written written by Malachi Jode himself. These were listed as, protect your family first, then protect the clan. Steal nothing from the others in the clan. Hoard nothing that could benefit others in the clan. These points would go on to be the foundations of their society, but within a matter of days, the newly formed clan had an immediate problem. They wanted revenge and badly against their attackers, despite Malachi's objections. But despite this, the others continued on. But they originally did not want to start an attack like the raiders had done to them. Instead, they just wanted to steal their livelihood, leaving them without resources to live through the winter. But it did not go that way in the end. Instead, the newly formed clan completely raided all of the farms stores and homes they could reach, with some going on to kill some for the fun of it, and some doing other dishonorable acts, including kidnapping young men and women. By the morning, one third of the original attackers had been killed during this what was meant to be non-violent raid, on top of many being kidnapped and their resources being completely stolen. But returning back, Malachi and many of the other members would be furious with these actions as it just attracted unwanted attention from the law, which no doubt still existed somewhere. But one week after these events, a horrific earthquake hit Los Angeles, stripping its status as a land of milk and honey. This would go on to massively stress out the nomads, but quickly some realized this was an opportunity for them to seek out work there to maybe help them rebuild. And with that, they would go on to travel to the area and set up a remote camp there, sending out emissaries to speak with the authorities. This plan was perfect as they were able to beat two other more experienced groups for the rebuilding contracts and landed themselves a perfect deal. But realizing they needed to keep up a good reputation with other nomads, they agreed to share some of the work, with them still leading it at the helm. Still during this time, they were not officially labeled as anything. However, as legal documents needed signing, Malachi, their leader, chose the name Jode on their contract with the city of Los Angeles. And now to this day, that is how the group of nomads are known as. To this day, the Joes do not like static situations as they find it deeply uncomfortable. And on top of that, have also developed other world views, including the spirits of the open road, the zeitgeist, fear of imprisonment, and many other things. What was just a group of desperate individuals has now become a well-respected nomad clan who will do anything to survive and have very set rules on how to live. Whilst they have a dark past, most only want to just continue living on with the protection from the rest of their clan. After the collapse had taken a hold on the country and world, the city of Miami would go on to become a complete war zone, as well as being the center of the drug trade for almost 20 years. Before the collapse, it was also the target for mass immigration, both legal and illegal from Cuba and Haiti. Because of the overwhelming influx of refugees due to the South and Central Americas heating up massively, Miami became massively overwhelmed by people and was ready to burst. But unfortunately, most of the refugees were also into criminal acts before coming to the country, meaning Miami was becoming a dangerous area. But as the climate got worse, it would go on to ruin the drug trade completely, as well as destroying all vital crops, forcing many to try and create synthetic drugs instead. As the drug industry suffered, gun violence increased for a bit, but eventually would die down, all apart from within Miami, which would only get worse, leading to the whole city to become the city of flames. To control this, the government cordoned off the areas and just allowed the combatants 
residents to exhaust themselves, allowing them to kill one another as, in the government's eyes, only criminals remained in the city and the good-willed people, aka the rich, had left months ago. In 1996, the war in Miami was over and essentially the city was destroyed, similar to the city of Beirut, with half-demolished buildings and bullet-riddled car wrecks. But one group survived all of this and rose victorious. That was the crew of the Bloods. Originating as a criminal organization with chapters all across of the United States, this group would be the rulers of Miami. Formed from Haitian and other Caribbean immigrants who had traveled to Miami, they had formed into this new society and developed their Caribbean, African-American and Cuban South American cultures. On top of that, they were also extremely battle-hardened thanks to the events within Miami. For a while, the Bloods continued on, but they would go on to change going into the late 90s as the collapse would go on to completely shut down a circus company that was regarded as the greatest show on earth, as well as many other adventure parks which included the famous Disney World. With all of these individuals out of a job with all of their equipment, they would go on to meet with the members of the Bloods in 1999, and those who were seen as okay were allowed to stay with them, and together these individuals of the Disney employees, the circus, and the Bloods would go on to create the greatest traveling entertaining group of the new millennium. And in 2000, the Bloods would go on their first national tour. Initially, this touring group would number around 10,000 people, but that would quickly go down to just 5,000 people on a regular basis. The Bloods became known all over the country and entertained not just static communities, but other nomad communities as well, and were labeled as something special with their most profitable areas being within the rebuilding cities of Los Angeles and Mexico City. Eventually, they became so successful that they needed a new way to travel and a place they could essentially call their HQ. With this, they took to the old Disney World facilities and went on to construct huge trucks and airships to help them travel even further and faster across the Americas. But as 2008 rolled around and civilian control took over America, the Bloods were thrown out of the Disney complex with the Lazarus Group sent in to retake it for interests linked to the Disney Corporation. As the soldiers entered the area, the Bloods had a choice. They could fight off the soldiers but would most likely lose many in the process and would most likely lose altogether. Or they could gather their stuff and live out on the road once again in true nomad fashion. After a passionate speech by their leader at the time, Malcolm Kent Smith, the crew decided to go full nomad, taking all of their stuff with them and traveling the open lands once again. With them leaving the area, luckily most of the Bloods were not bitter about what had happened, actually realizing that in the long run, this was not a good place to stay and there was just no way they could defend themselves from a full military force on a regular basis. With this happening, the original Bloods returned back to their home of Miami, where they would start constructing the Atlantis complex with the help of other nomad clans. Alongside this, others were sent to travel abroad to other countries to help spread their traveling entertainment business. And for the Bloods, they are now the largest traveling entertainment groups in the world. Because of this success and their origins, whilst they are the second youngest nomad clan, only living out on the road since 2008, they are one of the most equipped groups out there and can easily defend themselves from most other factions aside from full government or corporate militaries. But with all that said, without a main base to set up in, the future for the Bloods is very worrying, especially for their leader Malcolm Kent Smith. Whilst they have been extremely successful in terms of entertainment, growing pressure from governments and the economy makes their lives extremely worrying, and maybe they will not be able to do what they do for long. But for now, they are regarded as one of the most successful traveling entertainment nomad groups the world has ever seen. Working in affiliation with the Bloods is the medium-sized group of nomads called the Gargoyles, who was set up and created by the civil engineer professional who works during the height of the collapse, known as Sadie Jacobs. Being in her 60s now, Sadie has inspired many of her younger members and has taught them the tricks of the trade when it comes to engineering and has helped them to get many jobs all over the country. But Sadie is old and tired now and is considering leaving as the clan's leader soon and just settling down 
town somewhere after working hard her whole life. But the gargoyles are not just small time engineers, they also work as supervisors for other nomad families who work on large construction jobs. They are also constantly bidding on upcoming projects like reconstructions and government projects within cities such as New York. But overall because of their skills they have learned from Sadie Jacobs, the gargoyles are extremely well off and can stand out in the job market compared to many other nomad communities. In terms of their work ethic, they love to complete things before a deadline, always looking for jobs that pay a bonus for early completion. To other nomads, they are seen as just pure workaholics, but for the gargoyles, it just gives them a purpose in life and they really enjoy it. But because of their work and lifestyles, this means the gargoyles have to own and know how to use a vast amount of technology, including cyberware. For children within this clan of 300, they will be taught these valuable skills through many different books, as well as a fully equipped VR education system. With all of this, the next generation is perfectly trained up to continue their work as a clan. But on top of all of that, the clan uses a lot of cyberware, most likely to make sure they will be fine when on a construction site from any accidents or unpredictable incidents. If they were to be injured at work, using their cyberware, they could just share off a limb and continue on with their work without delay and then get it replaced at a later date. In summary, the gargoyles are some of the hardest working individuals you will ever meet. And if you ever needed to rebuild anything, they would arrive in their masses and would have it done before your end deadline. Blaine family is arguably the smallest nomad clan if you can even call it that. They are essentially just a small pack within the larger nomad nation. Led by Tommy Blaine, he regards them and himself as the truest nomads that ever existed as he has never affiliated with anyone that has been known to be static. Married to him is his wife known simply as Martha, who was referred to as mum by the rest of the Blaine family. With her son named Daniel being a warrior who guards their library and the memories of her late daughter to Marie, who was killed in an accident on the road a few years back. The Blaine family are a group of agricultural nomads who, like many other agricultural nomads, always have to be on the move due to the nature of their work and the decisions made by the corporations who believe that moving the nomads regularly will keep them closely tied to them through them having to buy fuel and parts on a regular basis. This idea doesn't necessarily work, however, as the nomads do not use the corpos at all and in fact make them even more more reliant on their own salvaging skills and their own means of survival. For the Blaine family, they are deeply religious but do not talk about it much at all, keeping that side of them very private. At the same time, they do understand that the young generation will do things their elders do not approve of, but there is no way to stop them doing that without driving them away, which they do not want to do at all. With a life on the road doing their agricultural stuff, the Blaine family keeps things very simple in terms of what they carry on their travels, especially on on foot. That said, however, they do travel with many vehicles that are able to carry twice as many members than they currently have. Their vehicles are mainly semi-tractors that have various trailers attached to them, but sadly because of this, the family do not have any armor so to speak of, meaning that defending themselves is not really possible. With that said, the Blaines do have five outrider teams they send out, three at the front and two at the back. The ones at the front are made up of three pairs of motorcycles that are equipped with 25 kilometer scrambled radios as well as LMGs or long range battle rifles. Despite these teams there are no warrior roles for anyone within the Blaine family. If one of the young members wants to become a warrior they will be encouraged to go out and train with another nomad group, most likely being the yet to be explored Aldecados, and would always get Tommy Blaine's blessing. Essentially that is all there is to the Blaine family, apart from one mysterious thing that happens some nights, where in camp there is a sudden commotion as a panzer or fast armored truck comes into camp and very quickly leaves. But no matter who you ask about this, no one really knows what this is all about. This is rumored to be linked to Tommy and a few other members of the family having links within a large smuggling network, which they do in secret. If they were to be found out to be involved in this, the local authorities would not hesitate to arrest the Blaine family due to them not being large enough to really defend themselves or threaten the law enforcement officers. If they were to be attacked by these 
forces, they would surely be destroyed forever as they have no way to defend themselves from these forces at all, thanks to them just being a simple agricultural family. In the end, this is just a loyal family looking to survive by any means necessary, but always keeping to themselves and making sure they never get into trouble with forces larger than they could take on. Heading into the more recognisable nomad clans, we have the Wraiths, who lurk outside of Night City. Unfortunately, however, not much is known about their origin story, why they founded, or really why they do what they do. What is known is that this clan of nomads are known as a group of Raff and Shiv, also known as rogue nomads, who travel mostly at night. It is said that they take enjoyment out of preying on the sleeping and unwary for some reason, maybe as a power move, or maybe just to satisfy their sadistic tendencies. Their leader is a man known only as Dog Killer and is rumoured to go around wearing clothing that is made of pure human skin. Locating themselves within the Badlands, they are known for one thing and that is their endless war with the other large group of nomads known as the Aldecados that has sometimes, more often than not, turned extremely bloody with many being killed within their battles. Roaming around the Badlands, the Wraiths are known for using their 1000 horsepower car that they call the Reaver, a beautiful piece of technology that helps them stand out from anyone else on the roads. But like many nomad clans who try and avoid the law, the Wraiths do exactly the same, but will not care about pushing the barriers of what is right and wrong as they will get outright aggressive to anyone on the outside of Night City, stealing their possessions and most of the time killing them in the process. On top of that, the clan will also go on to raid small villages, smaller nomad settlements, and even weakly guarded corp transports to gain their their technology and anything else of value they might be carrying. Technology wise, the Wraiths are known for using it on a regular basis, with many of their members having cyberware and other equipment that increases their reflexes, pain editors, and on top of that, also use it to enhance their vehicles and military grade equipment. In summary, the race might just be a small group of 300 to 1200 rejects from other nomad nations, but their ferocity is not to be laughed at, as they can be absolutely ruthless if you get on their wrong side. So if you are travelling out of Night City and happen to be within the Badlands, be wary of these rogue nomads who will want to take what you have and raid your small settlement in the dead of night. And finally on the list of all the nomad families, we have the original nomads who formed way back in the 1990s, the Aldecados. This group originated within the warring city of Los Angeles during the peak of the collapse. Their founder Juan Aldecado was once a migrant who wanted to turn his life around and make a name for himself within America. Going through the education system and graduating from college, becoming the first in his family to do so, Juan became an engineer and worked within the defense industry, trying his best to make a stable wage for his family. But as the collapse hit the country, the defense industry became one of the largest industries hit due to the fact that there was a lack of war. And with that, it had to downsize massively, leaving Juan out of work completely. With his family so dependent on his work, Juan tried everything to make sure he had a stable income to pay off his debt, becoming a store clerk and even selling off his own home to make sure he could put food on the table. As time progressed on, the family would downgrade to some of the poorest neighborhoods available to them and then eventually a slum. Desperately trying to get his son and daughter to continue on in school to escape a horrible future, Juan would experience deep pain as his daughter Maria would go on to be killed in a car accident the day before her 17th birthday. His son Ramon was deeply distressed by his sister's death and because of it dropped out of school completely. With him leaving the school he would go on to date a girl who was a member of the Red Dogs gang and with that also became a member. But sadly more tragedy would occur to Juan as Ramon would be shot in a so-called robbery on his 19th birthday. As the police arrived on the scene, so did Juan, as did the media, as almost immediately Juan, mad with rage, yelled at both the police and the journalists, stating that they were jackals and vultures who make a living off of the poor victims of this country. With this response, Juan replayed on screens all over America and became known for this outburst on the scene of the crime. By 2002, more tragedies 
struck Juan as he would go on to also lose the father figure of the Adocados family, leaving Juan as the main patriarch to lead the family into the future. But as he was also getting older, he needed to find someone else to help him and use as his successor. But unfortunately, this search continued for years as he could not find the right candidate. By this point, the Aldecados clan were fully established, with all nothing grand as they were just trying to survive with Juan at the helm. The elders of the Nomad clan argued for weeks about an election, but Juan kept stating he wanted no part in politics because if the family were to get political, it could potentially tear them in two and ruin the family. As the family got close to signing the contract for the rebuilding of Mexico City, Juan Aldecado would sadly suffer a heart attack, which he luckily survived, but it did set him back massively, even though he continued to try and push the family forward. As the contract was eventually signed, the job within Mexico City was perfect for the clan and helped them massively. Luckily for them, Juan's health massively improved during this time and the clan were able to restock on everything they needed. At the same time, the Aldecados would go on to help other individuals walking across Mexico. But this did not sit well with the government at all, who tried immediately to shut down the clan and stop them from coming back across the border. But luckily for the Aldecados and the other civilians, there were more of them than border guards, meaning the government's attempts were useless. Returning back to America in 2015, the clan was able to bring back a ton of extra resources from their journey to Mexico City, as well as the body of their once great leader who had died during this time, Juan Aldecado. His body was then buried close to his wife and his children back in his home city of Los Angeles, with many of the family mourning this great man that did everything he could to see his family thrive. With those extras, the Aldecados were also able to bring back many new members who were on the long walk and bring them into their clan. And alongside this, also brought back America's favorite rocker boy, Johnny Silverhand, who had been hiding from the authorities with them for almost two years. With Juan gone, however, it was time for a new leader, but politics was still out of the question. This needed to be a family member who could continue the great work of Juan and push them even further forward. That leader was chosen and was the man who had been with them on this long journey from their roots in Los Angeles, that being Santiago, who was appointed their new leader at Juan's deathbed. To this date in 2077, the Aldecados still live on, with one of their split-off groups taken to the Badlands under the leadership of Salt Bright, who continues to try and keep the family surviving and thriving, desperately looking for work for them within Night City. But Sol was different. Instead of doing the classic smuggling that the other Aldecados did out within the rest of the new United States of America, Sol just wanted to find simple work, even considering working with large corporations. But this did not sit right with many of the Aldecados, who wanted the freedom from the corporate control, stating they'd rather just join the Snake Nation to continue being nomads, instead of cave into the corpos and becoming slaves. The fate of the Badlands Aldecados relies solely on their family member Pan Am, as well as V, who gets to see both sides of the argument. Will they continue to follow the leadership of Sol, who will do anything just to see them survive, selling them out to corpos? Or will they follow Pan Am's plan and help them be free from control and thrive as the proud nomads they have always been known for. In the end, the Aldecados are arguably the most iconic nomad nation out there in the new United States, and it's almost certain that their story will live on for many, many years. But with all of that said, these have been the stories of all of the nomad clans and nations out there within the new United States of America. Will we get to explore more in the future, or have some not been able to survive into the year of 2077? We will just have to wait and see. But this, this has been the story story of all of the nomads of cyberpunk. I want to say a massive thank you to you all for watching this video and I really appreciate you for sticking around. I did not expect this video to be so long but there were more nomad clans than I initially expected when I started writing. But again a big thank you for watching and a big thank you to my patrons who allow me to make videos like this including our small fishes, my big fishes, Christopher, Last Persona User and Arto Krem, my YouTube channel Wise Ones, Fiery Italian, Ico the Wolf and Sith Lord 906, my Sharks Well Such Gaming, Jason X117 and 
and Breadbeard, and my Megalodons, Sinus, Jacob Garcia, and Chernobyl Stalker. If you also want to support this channel, you can find the link in the description below, as well as my Discord, which is just open, so come and join that if you want to talk about more lore. But if not, please do leave a like, check out my other lore videos, leave a subscribe if you haven't already, support me through buying yourself a tub of G Fuel with my link to get 20% off your order, and why not leave a nice comment to help get this video out there. But that is all for now, stay safe out there, and see you all in the next one. Cheers. Thank you.